something I posted on Spy Culture a while back was a record of Patrick Stewart visiting the CIA headquarters. Patrick Stewart, the actor, of course, well known, but probably best known from Star Trek, um, which is probably the show in which kind of the security state and the transhuman agenda was most perfectly combined in that you have these people on this futuristic military militarized spaceship i know it's it's an essentially peaceful show or at least it tries mm-hmm. to be and they play pay lip service to this notion but let's face it whenever the klingons turn up they have a fight with them so um well it's it's like the un with its security council and all that yeah mm-hmm. Similar yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah. Similar idea. Same kind, of, um, same kind of logic, but as applied intergalactically. Mm-hmm. And the one bit that I wanted to uh, just highlight in this show and get your, your reaction to was um, Patrick Stewart said in this, this sort of interview in the internal CIA magazine that he thought the values of Star Trek and the values of the CIA were very similar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, I, we'd Which, have to, firstly, I'm not convinced they are, but, you know. Yeah. What, what, what val- did he go into any detail what values those might be? He didn't really explain it. I mean, he kind of uh, uh, said that his initial Im- his sort of understanding of the CIA and his impression of the CIA had largely been derived from books and films. Um, mm-hmm. And so, obviously, he had quite a, if you like, realistic but negative um, view of the agency. Ah, but having yes. visited it and been schmoozed and been, you know, been flattered and been told how good he was in that spy film and all of this kind of stuff, uh-huh. uh, he he suddenly changed his mind and was happy to go on record saying, yes, yes, I think the values of this ridiculous utopian sci-fi TV <laughs> are, are the same as this this murderous agency that exists in real life, and that I've been persuaded that all of that kind of MK Ultra stuff that that doesn't really matter. What matters is that you know they invited me to Langley and gave me some tea and biscuits. And I, yeah. just, I find the whole thing absurd. Patrick Stewart is supposed to be quite an intelligent man. Most people would consider him an intelligent man, largely because he speaks in a posh accent. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Well, listen to his voice. He yeah. must be. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is this, this, this thing in both of our countries where, for some reason, if someone speaks confidently in a posh accent, people think they're clever and know what they're talking about. It doesn't matter uh, what the fuck they're saying. It doesn't matter at all. <laughs> It's just if they have that kind of delivery, then, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he, you know, Obama's got a bit of this going on. He's got a bit of that kind of English pos- poshness to his accent at times. A little bit, yeah. He's got kind of like the haltiness even of if we're going to Star Trek, the Commander Kirk, a little bit like that. Not quite as extreme. And he has got the sort of physique that would look quite good in one of those Star Trek bodysuits. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, he does seem like he would, yeah, he'd, he'd slip right in on those things. <laughs> Oh man, I, I gotta be honest. I, when it comes to Star Trek, I'm certainly not a fan, a Trekkie, or anything like that. I've, I've barely even watched the show. Uh, oddly enough, I, I, I'm not saying that I'm not proud of this. Or I'm not. It's just I'm kind of ambivalent to it for whatever reason. I never got into the show. I I like Doctor Who a lot. I'm really into that show. I love that. <laughs> Um, but I <laughs> kind of this bonkers British version of Star Trek that doesn't make. Yeah, sense. yeah, I, I love that. I, I love Doctor Who, but for some reason I never got into Star Trek. I don't know why. No, no, I mean fair, fair enough. I was never. I, I watched the Next Generation in the 1990s. That was a thing when I was a teenager watching that in the 90s. I haven't mm-hmm. really watched it since then because I've just sort of grown out of it. Um, yeah. But as anyway, you know, that's why I know Patrick Stewart, and that's why very much why I identify him in in that kind of role. Now, there was a similar sort of thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, and that was the third Iron Man film. And the particular reason, aside from the obvious themes of transhumanism and militarization that are underpinning all of those films and indeed all of the superhero films that we've had recently. Yes. Yes. um, I did think that this third one was a little different. For one thing, it was more of a transhuman film than it was a war on terror film. The second one, the first one in particular, is a war on terror film. The second one, a bit oh, less yeah. so, but it's still basically a you know rogue Russian guy going around with his drone bot, whatever things. Whereas the third one, it wasn't really about that. And I do wonder, I know that the first film was made with the assistance of the Air Force's Office of Public Affairs and their entertainment industry liaison and all of that. And I'm pretty sure the second one was as well. I get the impression, maybe with the third one, that it, it had more of a 
transhuman influence than it did a military intelligence government influence on it. Hmm. And what, what do you, I don't know, what do you make of that? Well, I, I don't know the details, but I'd like to know if it was still the Air Force working with the, the production company on this. I don't know. That would be important to look at for sure. Hmm. I know that the Air Force Entertainment Liaison Office tends to make the most transhumanistic films of the, the military that, that I can make, uh, th- th- at least from my point of view, because I know they did the Transformers films, mm-hmm. and that has a lot of transhumanistic... The artificial intelligence side of the transhumanist uh, concept is the biggest thing, sort of the bonding of man and machine is what they're getting out of those. I haven't seen Iron Man 3 yet, but I've heard a lot about it. I, I hear it's, a lot of people say it's actually good. Um, da, da, da. With your, You made a good point in that these superhero movies, every single one I've seen, hi, highly uh, militarized and because most of them are made with these liaison offices help. Yeah, sure. Uh, even, even the most recent um, Superman movie was being that was too it was promoted by the national guard oh okay there you go so yeah. you know even with that which is it's not obvious where the kind of military angle would be in the, in a superman film but even mm-hmm. that one they, they still had this kind of relationship i i know that the incredible hulk movie a few years back was incredibly transhumanistic they they had um uh again it was a military thing too there was this um some sort of pill or something that they took and then it ended up uh, mutating their body and they got all strong and that's how the Hulk got created and some other guy who is a special forces guy takes the same thing and he's evil and so that movie was incredibly transhumanist I, I how how is Iron Man 3 transhumanist I'd just like to hear some details about it well okay I suppose the thing that, that stood out for me is that in the first film he whatever his name, Tony Stark, is kidnapped by a bunch of Al-Qaeda or something, Taliban, um, and he starts wreaking his revenge on them. And the rest of the film is about, largely about him kicking hell out of terrorists. And this is mm-hmm. what I expect the RoboCop film is going to be like. From the trailers, it looks like they're going in that kind of direction. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one, as I said, it's a bit more kind of rogue Russian going bonkers, but it's a similar sort of thing. The narrative is basically... Uh, there is a terrorist threat out there and we need this advanced transhuman technology to respond to it. And isn't it great that we have this wonderful Tony Stark engineer who can invent this stuff for us, even though he's yet another bored billionaire? Why are so many of these superheroes bored billionaires? Um, <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost like they're trying to heroize the billionaires or something. I mean, I can't, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't figure it out. But Yeah, um, definitely. And, but in the third one... It starts out similar kind of thing in that there is this supposed terrorist mastermind who's harassing the United States, and, and this is what Iron Man has to respond to. But it turns out that the terrorist isn't real. He's just a actor playing a terrorist, and he's a kind of front guy for some rogue transhumanist scientist who's creating this army of transhuman soldiers to try and take over the world. Um, mm. That's what Iron Man has to end up fighting. Now, mm. <clears throat> I'm not going to give away the ending for you, yeah, but there is a moment at which the two things, the kind of robotic transhumanism of Iron Man and yeah. biological transhumanism that this rogue terrorist guy is is using, where they are, where they merge. Basically. Yes, yes. I'll tell you exactly what happens, but that's one of the things that I thought when you see this film, you w- that will just go set off fireworks in your head. Um, that's that's typically what happens with these movies. They set up like the enemy being some sort of transhumanist thing, in this case, the biological side, uh, genetic engineering, whatever, what have you. And then in order to fight that difficult foe, one has to either use the same technology or a better technology to defeat that. And then in the end, you kind of see, you usually do see the two come together, but it's it's always like uh using high technology tra- high transhumanist technology to overcome the same thing and that's the only way to do it uh, the terminator series is uh it's a clear example of doing this like the only way to defeat an artificial intelligence a powerful one is by using that same artificial intelligence mm. against itself and then the only way that at the end of the robocop film the only way he defeats the Ed 209 that's protecting this big corporate conspiracy that's taking over the city of Detroit 
Um, the only way he can do it is by using superior force. Mm-hmm. You know, he has to blow up the Ed 209 at the end of the film that stood outside the corporate headquarters. And it's only by Robocop. I mean, the, sort of the, to- the story in Robocop is, is kind of about a man getting turned into a transhuman and then rediscovering his humanity. But in terms yeah. of the narrative, the way it actually pans out, he has to embrace being a transhuman in order to succeed, in order to defeat the bad guys. Yeah. So even in that film, which I adore, <laughs> oh, yeah. even in that one, I'm still left thinking, but the conclusion is, you know, something that I don't want to believe. It's the, yeah. it's the conclusion, it's, you know, it's some values that just don't tally with me. Mm-hmm. Um, now, another Hollywood movie that I'm sure you have seen, Escape from New York. You may not. Oh, uh, yeah. Why? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that, and I've seen Escape from L.A., too, the, re- the remake of it. <laughs> I've never seen the sequel, no. <laughs> I've never it's, sequel. it's basically a humorous remake of the original film, is all it is, yeah. Oh, okay. It probably, I'll probably quite enjoy it, then. I mean, the, I found the first one particularly funny, to be honest. I thought it was a really quite amusing film. Oh, yeah. For a dystopian yeah. movie, at least, anyway. Um <laughs> But there, there is a thing, this is something I came across by putting together several different kind of bits of info from different places. But the, the basic story is, in Escape from New York, a lone white female terrorist, for some reason, well, the reason is, never mind what the reason is. Um, there's a lot of lone white female terrorists in late 70s, early 80s movies. Um, that was, for some reason, that was the terrorist du jour. I'll leave people to figure out why that is. Um <laughs> Anyway, she hijacks Air Force One, the president's plane, and crashes it into lower Manhattan in a suicide hijacking. And this film was made in 1980 or something. Mm-hmm. You know, this is like 20 years before 9-11, someone's suicide hijacking into lower Manhattan. Um, yeah, yeah. So if that's a piece of predictive programming, it's going back a long way. Indeed. Um, and, the, and the president escapes from the plane in a little capsule. He lands in Lower Manhattan, which has been, and the whole of Manhattan Island has been turned into this sort of dystopian prison where they're sending all the criminals to, so they all kind of kill each other. Um, yeah. And they have to send someone in to get the president out. And of course, there's no better man for the job than Kurt Russell. But yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> the, scene, the scene that I particularly wanted to draw your attention to is when they inject a capsule into Kurt Russell's arm that contains poison, and they tell him that. You know, the capsule will dissolve in. That's right. Yeah. That's how many hours it is that he has to get in, get the president and get back out again. That's right. Yeah. yeah I forgot about that part. Of it. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, it's just one of those little details that, that stuck with me. And then years and years later, um, I was reading about this guy called Ali Mohammed, who is one of the CIA's main guys within Al Qaeda. Ali Mohammed was like uh, he was the main trainer for al-qaeda from about 1988 to about 1998 for a decade he was the guy who was training bin laden's bodyguards and he was close friends with zawahiri and he was you know trained people who did the world trade center bombing and he trained the people who did the embassy bombings in 98 and you know he is a really really important figure in this story and his background is was working for the cia at least for most of the 1980s if not his entire career inside al-qaeda so after 9 11 uh, Ali Mohammed was arrested after the embassy bombings in 98. So by the time of 9-11, he's just sat in some prison somewhere. After 9-11, a Delta Force commander by the name of Pete Blaber came across this guy, this Ali Mohammed story, and everyone was rushing around sort of trying to come up with a way to find bin Laden. You remember after 9-11, there was this big thing about hunting guys. Oh, uh, yeah. You yeah, gotta go find him. Yeah. You, you know, Although, yeah. Didn't really go anywhere. There was about 10 minutes <laughs> in which nothing happened on that front. And then suddenly they said, oh, yep, found him and he's dead. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, a, lot of talk, a lot of talk uh, was uh, bouncing around, that's for sure. That sure happened. <laughs> so anyway, immediately after 9-11, he's, he is uh, uh, working in Delta Force. This is the counterterrorism special forces. So he's trying to come up with ways to find bin Laden in Afghanistan. And he finds mm-hmm. out about this guy, Ali Mohammed who had, of course, been running training camps in Afghanistan up until a couple of years earlier and was close friends with bin Laden and knew everyone and all of this stuff. So he actually suggested doing a Escape from New York style thing 
with Ali Muhammad in the Kurt Russell role, where they would in- inject him with a poison capsule, <laughs> drop him in Afghanistan, and give him like <laughs> 48 hours to find Bin Laden. And he, he records this in his book. He wrote a book, which is like a self-help book written by a special forces guy. <laughs> oh, boy. The weirdest book I've ever read. I only read it, only got it. It's got this Ali Muhammad story in I found like, <laughs> Ali Muhammad. So I thought, but, uh, and he was floating uh, this as a serious idea. They never actually did it, of course. But, but it just and that's predictive programming in action, isn't it? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even these special forces guys get caught up in it. 